Jared, thank you so much for the time. How you doing today? I'm great. So good to be here with you. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Have you had a chance to hone your craft much in uh, our fair city of Austin, Jared, with you coming to town for Cap City Comedy Club this weekend? I've been to Austin many times. I'm excited to come back. Um, it's, you know, it's so funny now. It's like the hub of comedy, you know, and so it's it's now I feel like I'm going back to a different place a little bit now that the mothership is open and all the comedy stuff that's going on downtown I'm at Cap City, that club, you know, I've known for years and years. And it's it's kind of interesting because I live in New York and this is, you know, this is where stand up happens. And then you hear about people trickling over to Austin from both L.A. and New York. So it's a different place than I, I had been going to in the past where, you know, it's kind of a road weekend. Now it's more of a, you know, it's a it's a comedy town weekend. You're, I'm, I'm like coming to see the scene a little bit. Yeah, well, it's not just that, but you end up. You know, if you've got a new stand-up special or something, you end up doing a bunch of different podcasts while you're here as well. It's been fascinating to watch this transformation as somebody who's just a fan of the art form and has fantasized. And I realize it's weird to say fantasize when you're talking about going places to watch stand-up, but like I've wanted for a long time to go to someplace like the cellar or the comedy store. And now people feel that way about a bunch of different clubs here in Austin. And while Cap City has had a great reputation for a long time, I tell everybody who will listen to this, the Helium people have come in and reopened Cap City in a completely different space because it was kind of in an armpit part of town before, and it was still a great okay. club, don't get me wrong. The Helium people spared no expense with the new club in the domain area. Acoustically, the setup, it's as good as any club in town, and I encourage anyone to check a show out there, certainly uh, this Thursday through Saturday when you're going to be headlining there. Absolutely. I, yeah, I was there you know, when I first started doing the material that I'm like coming back with and mm. just like a comfortable place, I, you know, also like it kind of fits my age. I'm 39. I can tell that area is where a 39 year old and their, you know, their, their wife or their family, they're, where they're kind of starting up. It feels like I'm heading into the millennial comforter as i've come to call it where it's this area that feeds all of my pleasure sensors in my brain where it's like ooh the you know the taco place the bar that has you know chargers in the bar and like you know the and, and so i i kind of love that area because i don't know you know sixth street is is its own animal and beast but like i'm kind of done with that that beast i i've fought that fought that beast a couple times i'm okay with not, you know, and I remember Austin going there. It was like every street, every time I went there, a new street was the street. Like, right? Like it was like Rainy Street and then West Six and East Six. And it was always like this like moving target of where the cool place is to be. And now I'm happy to have aged out of cool places. I like Cap City at a mall, which is like a fake city. <laughs> Let me, you know, roll around in that you know, pig sty and feel good in it. Like, I love that. So I think if you're listening right now and you're agree, you're like nodding along with what I'm saying, like, it's okay. Get over yourself. You're not cool anymore. You're going to hang out at a mall on the weekend and you're going to really like it. And Cap City is like kind of part of that, you know, which is like, I'm, I'm happy to be performing there. Yeah, you've got a steakhouse on one side of the club. You got the Museum of Ice Cream on the other side. My wife and I were there this last week, and the Museum of Illusions is over there. There really is something for everyone. I love it. I, I I'm telling you, I'm like very. I I was there last time. It was the first time I was at like the new club, and I was like, man, I you have this moment where you're like, I'm so happy in this area. Like I'm so happy to not be on Sixth Street. Is really like. You know, with with all those people, just you know, the, you know the drunks that are all wandering around like zombies. Like, no, no, no. Let me be around like you know professional drunks around Cap City in that area. Yeah, I'm still amused by world star hip hop fights uh, on the internet. I just don't want to be in the background of one of those, much less catching a stray. I want to watch from the comfort of my own couch on my phone while wearing my sweat shorts and no shirt. And <laughs> that's where I want to watch my drunk videos from, you know, my, my drunkards from. Yeah. 
Sixth Street is an absolute S show, and uh, New York went through a little bit of a uh, little bit of an issue at the start of COVID. But is New York uh, starting to rebound as it always does from those tough times, Jared? New York, New York is great. I I was here through most of COVID, and then I live on our own kind of version of Sixth Street. I live in the West Village, which has become kind of you know it's gotten very young. I would say New York never really, I you know. To me, I had this talk with someone the other night. It's like it's street to street. You know, you, you yeah. know the streets to go on and the ones that you can hang out and have fun. And, you know, the streets that are like, eh, that's not a street I'm going to go hang out on. And I would say where I am in the West Village, it's just gotten young. It's it's interesting. It's like to live in New York City, you're either older and wealthy or you're young and you can feel OK splitting a two bedroom apartment with 10 people. And I'm in between like I'm doing well, but you don't, you never feel like you're doing well in New York city. Like yeah. I'm right now, my apartment is a studio. I'm a, in a one room apartment. Like I'm also 39. Like this isn't how 39 year olds are normally living. You know, they're like, you know, in a town outside of a big city. So you always have to, in New York, make, you know, decisions on your comfort. What do you want? You want space you want a fun area? Like, I remember my mom, she was like, I was like, I got a new apartment. I'm in the West Village. And I was so proud of being in the West Village because there's really no other place like that on earth. Like, I've traveled the whole country. It's beautiful. It's walkable. It's coffee shops and bars and fun. And anyone who's ever been here is like, oh, my God, this is heaven on earth. And it's it's amazing. But then my mom is like, well, do you have a parking space? And I was like, are you out of your mind? I don't even have a car. What do you mean? <laughs> Like, I was like, do we, we do we even speak the same language? You're asking me, and anyone can understand that. Like, you know, your mom asked you the one question that can make you rethink this thing that you were happy about 10 minutes before. I get both sides of that, though, because I grew up right. in Texas, and I ended up living in Chicago for a number of years, and I, I got there at a great time and lived there at a great time, too. Mm-hmm. But I struggled with the idea of not having a car until I realized, oh, there's actually such a thing as reliable pl- public transportation and everybody is or everything isn't a 30 to 45 minute car ride away like it is someplace like Texas. Right. It's just two different lifestyles, you know, yeah. like and, you know, one isn't good and one isn't bad. You know, like I think there's this thing right now, especially with the way, you know, Austin's one of those towns I've called it and I've had it town. Where people move to Austin after they've been in their town and they've said, I've had it, I'm moving. And Austin, Nashville, parts of Florida, uh, Boise, Idaho, the, I've traveled the whole country. You, you know, like I've seen it with my own eyes. These are all towns that are like with new demographics, new people moving in. And what's interesting is that when I go to Austin, I'll have people come to my show. They're like, Oh, I just want oh their whole personality is that they were from New York once. And I'm like, well, how about you just have fun here? Like I I and I don't need you to like it does feel like the people who move to Austin from other places need everyone to know they're doing just fine, which makes me feel like they're not doing fine. Like they are very worried about the opinions of others of their decisions to move there. And I'm like, listen, I, I hope it's going well. I don't need to hear how, you know, you, you know, you wish there was a better Italian food here. I don't, I don't go to Austin and look for pizza. I go to Austin. I look for barbecue. So I, I, I don't have this. So it is interesting because you travel so much and you find out the insecurities of people very quickly. Yeah. Austin has great barbecue. It has great tacos. Obviously it has good pizza too, but that's really, I'm, I'm only going to tell you to go get pizza there. If you don't come from a really good pizza place and you come from, right. Outside of Italy, what is probably the best pizza city on the planet? <laughs> Listen, I if someone said you got to try it, I'd be like, OK, but you're taking up a meal like I exactly I, when you whenever you travel, you get these suggestions. And I, I think recommendations sometimes will often reveal how narcissistic someone is because they just want you to go to the place they sent you to. They want to power over you. And it's like like when someone tells me. Oh, you're going to Austin? You got to try this pizza and and the bagel. And I'm like, are you thinking of me at all? Is this the best pizza that you have had in your entire life? 
And they, and then they'll look at me like, why would you ask? I don't know. And I'm like, then why would you suggest this actually happened to me? I went to Belfast. I did shows in Belfast, Ireland. Wow. Or Northern Ireland. I, uh, I'm screwing it up. Someone's mad at me now. Um, I, I went to Belfast and I was at a bar. It's two in the morning in New York City. Bars close at 4 a.m. here. Another perk or the worst thing that's ever happened to you. Depends on how you look at it. It's two in the morning. And it depends on the night. And it depends on the night, too. Right. It depends. And it depends on the next morning, too. You know, it's all perspective. So the bartender is from Belfast. And she looks at me and she goes, and I'm like telling her about my trip coming up. She's like, you got to get pizza when you go to Belfast. I go, I go, stop it. We are literally, I I, I go, stop it. We're in New York. She goes, it's the best pizza I've ever had. And I go, "That, that, that can't be. She goes, look it up. I look it up. It's called Flout Pizza, F-L-O-U-T. And I'm looking at what they're doing. And I'm like, this place does look amazing. I'm like, I can't believe it. And I start like looking into it. And I message the guy on Instagram. And he's like, and I'm like, hey, I'm going to be in town on this date. Can I come get some pizza? And he goes, we usually run out by 2 p.m. And I'm like, yep. These are magic words to me as a food person. You want to hear that there's scarcity. So I go, well, I'll be there around 2.30. Can you make something happen? He's like, I'll figure it out, whatever. I go to Belfast. The people at the hotel had never even heard of this place. I go visit this guy. I go take a Uber or whatever they use in Belfast. And I get there. He's waiting for me. And he starts telling me his story about how he started doing it during COVID. And he's become a pizza genius. And he's he's researched the oven. His whole life savings went in the oven. This became one of the best recommendations I've ever gotten. But it was not just to be like, I, I you, 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 it wasn't just to tell me where to go. It was because yeah. it was thoughtful. And did the pizza turn out to be that good too? Oh, it was the mo- it was unbelievable. It was one of the best I've ever had. It was, and he did it. It was a, there was a New York style. There was like a, a thick crust Detroit style. He was making homemade hot honey where the the the. Uh-huh. The, the the peppers in the hot honey were like chopped by him. Like it was like, and he, this guy was doing things. He, and now I talk about him a lot and he, I've, I've repeated this story. He keeps having people show up and I'm they're like, I heard, you know, this random guy in New York. And it, it just because I, I was drunk in New York. It's like, you're, you're sending me to pizza? What? But I, I, I really appreciate a thoughtful recommendation. See, there's a pizza place I love in Austin, but I would never give you that place. The flip side of that, by the way, is sometimes you think that you're going to go for a good meal where it's traditionally good. But like the worst piece of pizza I've ever had in my life was in Italy. It was my wife and I traveling on the coast and we had just gone through an all day hike and we're having to take a ferry back to this other little town along the coast from where we Mm. started and where we're trying to get back to. And we're like, oh, there's a, there's a pizza place right here. We'll just grab a quick slice of pizza. And it was clearly like a frozen pizza that they right. hadn't even taken the time to put in an oven. They just like microwaved it. And is- it tasted okay. But because right. of where we were and what our expectation was, it's like, this is hot garbage. I should have just waited to eat until we got back to the other town. Well, when a place gets known for something, that is an invitation to the people who care about it and the, and the grifters, you know, so to bring it back to comedy with Austin, you know, in Austin, I'm sure there's some great comics that have moved there. I'm also sure that there are some grifters that have moved there and they're, you're going to get with more comedy, you get more good comedy and more really awful comedy. So this is, you know, not to besmirch anyone who's moved there, but if someone's looking for an easy way to skip the line in comedy, which there's really no way to do that. You have to go on stage. You have to do your jokes. You have to tape your set. You have to listen to it and rewrite it. Then, you know, Austin's the place for that. So, you know, with, I've heard a lot of great things about Austin. I've also heard that it's a lot of like, uh, you're hearing a lot of the same type of stuff. So um, this is both, you know, this is relatable in, you know, New York. Oh, we got great pizza in New York. That doesn't mean every place is going to be great. No. And I've said that for a long time about the music here too, because before it was known as a live comedy capital of the world, Austin was the live music capital of the world. And you get great music as a result. Stevie Ray Vaughan, Gary Clark Jr., people like that. 
there is a lot of crap out there where you step into a <laughs> bar and there's live music playing. And it's like, oh, my God, this is nails on a chalkboard right now. Right. And the need to put that work in to figure out your cadence, to find your voice is obviously such an important part of the art form. Man, I wasn't all that familiar with your comedy before the last couple of days when we set this interview up, but I went back and watched 37 and Single on Netflix. Congrats on that, by the way. Came out Thank last you. year. That is hilarious. And you are someone who is very clearly comfortable with your comedy voice. How long did it take you to find that? Was there anything in particular that helped you get there, Jared? It's hard. You know, like I made the special 2022. Okay. And I made it myself. And then that was December 2022. And then summer 2023, it gets, um, you know, bought by Netflix, which is great. And then it comes out that summer, which is like the greatest thing to happen. What a what an amazing, you know, wonderful moment in my life. And I'm very proud of it. The jokes on 37 and Single are like the culmin like I've never taped anything. I I did one Fallon set to that point. Like I went on late night with Jimmy Fallon. That was a huge deal for me too. But like a lot of the things for me kind of happened later than a lot of maybe my peers. So like I had this like decade of jokes built up that like were from different parts of my life that made sense at certain times and I strung them together to make a special and I you know it was um it was I, I like the special I'm happy with it I'm proud of it it's it, but then I got done with it and I was like okay I've never had you know what a what putting out a special on Netflix and what taping a special gives you is it takes away all the crutches it takes away the joke that you know can save you if a joke isn't working. So it gave what it gave me is like this incredible amount of confidence, um, as well as like the ability to like move on, you know, to not sit there and be like, I know this joke deserves to be on something. You know, I didn't have to sit there and hold on to it. So I started the day, the next day after I taped the special December 2022. I went to Virginia Beach, Virginia. I did a show for 30 people um, in a mall. And I started telling this story about going to the beach with my parents. And I never really, and it never did well. It always bombed. And I'm like, I really think there's something to talk about here. And I had a joke leading into it that was working really well. So I'm like, at least I know the joke going into it is working well. So I started telling the story, which was a two minute story. And then using the old material around it to like fill out the set. Yeah. And now that two minute story is an hour and 15 minutes. And I've been telling it for now a year and a half since Austin. Austin was where it was like at 15 minutes the last time I was there. Mm -hmm. Now it's an hour 15. I went to Europe and did it. I did it. I've done it all over the country. It is ready to be filmed in December. I'm going to film basically two years to the day of the last special but this is the set I'm doing when I'm there. And it's about my parents and it's about uh, the millennial boomer relationship. And it is like, it's been like, it, it never would have happened if the special didn't happen. I wouldn't have pushed myself to stay with one story for an hour. Um, but that's what I've been doing. So I, it's been really cool to do. And, and, and honestly, like it's very, if people bring your girlfriend, bring your wife, bring your parents, like, Anyone could watch it. You're not going to be uncomfortable with whoever you bring. You're actually going to like be like it. To me, it's laughs every 10 seconds. Like it doesn't miss. I like also based on that description that it's a pretty big shift from the general theme of 37 and single, which you don't yeah. have to be a genius to figure out uh, what the tone of that special is. The fact that you have taken a story and turned it into a son and parent relationship and how generations come together. I believe your parents live in Florida, correct? They're living in Boca. They're as crazy as it gets. Yeah. They're like out of a Seinfeld episode. And I never really thought they were interesting to talk about. Like I was like, who would mm -hmm. want to hear about my parents? And I over, I, I just, these stories kept happening and they kind of went into the story, the overall, like, just like, you know, I like my family. I don't have a dark story to tell. I don't have yeah. a tragic tale. Like, and you see that there's a, in comedy, there's just a lot of like, kind of like you know it's like tragedy porn like it's yeah. like and and it's people saying well i have to have this thing so that i deserve to go on stage and even have an opinion 
I don't buy that. Like I have a good life. I have good parents that I love and, and I also can't stand them, you know? And it's like, that's like the normal thing. And like, like I was with my mom the other day, I made a video, it's on TikTok, and she's literally telling me to go on. My dad wants me to take his Ozempic for the week. And I'm like, and I'm like literally looking at her going, you don't know this is insulting. Like the, you don't just go tell people to take Ozempic. Like that's like, and like, she's like laughing in the video and like, I can't believe this is happening. And I was like, I want to run out of this house and never come back again. And then we're eating dinner together that night. And she's telling me to get a drink with her and, you know, have the fries. Like it just does nothing makes sense. So it's really all about that. It's like, it's just so stupid. <laughs> all right. Not for, uh, not to make an abrupt pivot, but here's an abrupt pivot. Uh, you were in Indianapolis, I think last weekend or in the last couple of weekends. And part of the time there you attended an Indianapolis Indians minor league baseball game and got to throw out a first pitch, thrown out one first pitch in my life. I know how nerve wracking that can How'd be. How'd you do? Uh, uh, it was a dead red strike. It may have been an ethos. Yeah. Pitch. It may have been an EFIS pitch. It may have been coming in at like 45 miles per hour, but it was a strike. Uh, how'd you do? Good for you. I, I went, it went high. I didn't want to bounce it. That was my only thing. Yep. Don't bounce it. And then, you know, like you said, it's stressful. You know, you've seen those videos of like people throwing the first pitch where it like literally hits the ground four inches in front of them. And then you have this thought, you're like, maybe I'll do the Bill Murray thing. But like, that's the genius of Bill Murray. He owns the throw the baseball over the fence move. Like now you're a hack. So I was like, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta do this. And I, and I went high to the right, high, high and inside. Um, and I was so happy. Like I, I can't tell you, and I'm sure you felt the same way. Like you, you get done and you're like, oh my God, I am so relieved. I am so happy. It went just medium. Like, I think like as men, we are trained our whole lives, like, just don't open yourself up to be roasted for the rest of your life. Like, and you're just like, do like either, either be exceptional or just quietly skate by so that no one makes fun of you. And that is like, I was so happy to just like throw a normal throw. Yeah, there's also the option of trying to hit the mascot behind home plate, but that's also a pretty big risk too because if you miss, then you look like a jackass who missed that badly. You have to right. hit the target if you're going to do that. Right? No, 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 no. You, you, you better I, at that point just throw fire. You know, like, like you know, I, I, you, I, the whole day I was like, what am I going to do? What's the move? What's the move? What's the move? And I'm like, just throw it well. Just, yeah. And I, you know, you don't get to practice. Like I thought they would like at least let me throw, you know, to someone like, and I'm throwing it in the air, like above my head to try and just get the, <laughs> like the rhythm back. I haven't thrown a baseball in a decade. I mean, I played like, you know, I played lacrosse in the spring. I wasn't a baseball player. Like, you know, you just like, uh, I, 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 it is so funny that like, as men, I think men, we carry that. Like, I don't think, like, I think, I don't think a lot of women would be like thinking of all the, you know, the, the sports center, you know, bloopers they've seen over the course of their life. Like I, I just thought of every single, you know, bad sports center, you know, not top 10. Oh yeah. 50 cents. I mean, you see the, the yeah. gymnast that do the cartwheel and somehow throw a strike. You're like, ah, That's they're great. High bar set here. I actually had the option of there's a, they put a little rubber down in front of the pitcher's mound. They're like, you can throw it from here if you want to. I'm like, no. you're your freaking mind. That's yeah. worse than bouncing a pitch in, throwing from in front of the pitcher's mound. So I actually did go out, and I know you may not have had this luxury. I went out and practiced a couple of days beforehand. Like uh, you had not thrown a baseball in forever. I'm like, I don't even know if I can do this. I may have to back out if it's this bad. But I felt okay. I got my my mini warm up and my step to the plate okay. And I'm like, okay, I think I can do this. And fortunately, so it turned out okay. I was there with my my daughter at the time. Was like three years old, I want to say. And she was like standing behind me on the pitcher's mound. I'm like, this is either going to be something that you're talking about uh, to a therapist years from now, watch <laughs> dad do terribly in the meltdown in front of everybody. Or you may be a little bit proud of me, or you may just be right. three, you know the difference one way or the other. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> Your daughter just like not respecting you forever. She's like, no, I saw that pitch. <laughs> you, uh, I heard you mention that you went to Indianapolis Speedway while you're there too. Was there uh, anything notable about that? So I went to a Ferrari event. 
Oh, I didn't wow. realize that Ferrari, when you, so apparently Ferrari throws an event where rich people can just like do like F1 cosplay. So this was like, I guess it costs like a million and a half dollars and you can have your own team and they'll ship your car there. And it's all part of this like money making thing from Ferrari. Like when you go buy a Ferrari, I didn't, you, I mean, you don't know until you know, like who would know, but my cousin's a big car guy. And he was like texting me. He's like, how did you get there? He's like, I've heard of these things. So I guess when you buy a Ferrari, they'll look at you and go, yo, here are the keys, sir or ma'am. And then they'll go, how would you like to go to Ferrari driving school? And they're like, Sh and then you go, why would anyone do this? And then they let me test drive a Ferrari. You're like, I need to drive this on a course. Like, you you know, right? Because your toe touches it and it's at 50. And you're like, oh, my God, I need to go somewhere and, like, open this thing up. Even though I don't even know how to drive. Like, I'm not even a driver. I'm not even a car guy. But you, it runs through your veins the minute you touch the gas. So, I can understand how someone who buys a Ferrari is pretty high on themselves at the moment. They're like, do you want to go to the Ferrari driving school? And then they go and then they keep upselling you. It's like, I think it's like Scientology. They just keep like offering you more levels if you give them more money. And then I was at the highest level where you have a team. So you see these people walking around in like the fire suits and uh, they're the drivers, but they're also like billionaires. And you're like, what is this and they bring in like tv people to announce it so it feels like oh this god real thing but it's really just ferrari being like and it's for the dealerships like the dealership show up it's like a big like networking slash so i get in there because i had someone who you know listens to my podcast he was like hey my wife and i love you um i'm i, I would love to have you at ferrari you know whatever we're doing and it's at the Indy Motor Speedway, which is like, I'm a sports fan. I don't know if, you know, sports fans from other generations will have this because I think we're just more generalists because you put on Sports Center and you watch Sports Center. Like I have a a reference for like the guy drinking the milk and kissing the, you know, the bricks. And I think now we live in an opt-in society where it's like, why would if you don't opt into F1 then you don't know or if you don't opt into like Indy 500 how would you know but I'm like I've been watching sports center my whole life I was like I know of you know Helio Castro ne and Nevis or whatever so it was cool to see like you're like oh this is awesome I could see why this, this is and it's like so I ended up going on the course they brought they gave me like a, a ride with a professional driver and I will say we went 178 miles per hour you feel it. You are like, oh, my God, I can't believe I'm about to poop my pants next to this professional driver. Like, you feel your whole body change. It feels like your back is about to break. It's oh. crazy. And you're just laughing because you're like, I can't believe how little control I have of my life right now. So you were worried. So you were you could feel it. But were you worried for your life at all, considering how fast you were going? Or was the professional so good that you're like, oh, he's got it? You're worried. You're definitely, you know, he's a professional, but at the, like he's laughing at me screaming. But at the same time, you're like, it just feels like the car is about to, you, like the cars do flip. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, like this is <laughs> like something that I've never seen happen. Like in yeah. your mind, you're like replaying all the flip cars and we're desensitized. Like we've seen that, but we're like, oh, they might, everyone's okay. But you're like, no, not everyone's okay. People die, you know? And I'm sure we weren't even going, whatever he could go but you do see the athleticism mm. like how steady this guy had to be to be able to do what he was doing and he's just laughing at me he's like talking to me the whole time as if we're like going down the highway like and he's you know this was a, a track it wasn't an oval so it's just like it i mean unbelievable and then i get out of the car and they're like yeah that cost fifty thousand at auction to like do the three laps you did and i'm like man Ferrari has a business. That's when you start to realize like this business is a genius thing. Like they get you hooked and then they're like, here, we can feed you adrenaline anytime you'd like. It's crazy. It's like billionaire pickup basketball kind of. Right. That's a, that's a, I, I said very similarly. I said, this feels like signing up for youth soccer and playing intramural. Like that's what they're doing. <laughs>
Yeah, I know what you're feeling with the uh, with with that overall feeling too. Just based on trying to ride roller coasters, I'm 46. So trying to ride a roller coaster in my 40s, I loved roller coasters when I was a kid and a teenager. I ride roller coasters now. It's like you see the carny who is ultimately responsible for your well being and getting the thing started and stopped. But when you're up there, you're like, my God, if this thing has one misfire and starts to tilt to one way too far to the left or the right. We're plunging to our death right now, but I'm sitting next to my kids and they're just screaming out of glee and I'm clutching on for dear life. And I'm like, never again. Like I, they <laughs> do that if they want to. I'm not going to feel great about it, but I'm not going to be that a-hole parent. But none for me, thanks. The sad part of growing up is awareness. You know, like you wish yeah. you could just like stick to your blissful naivete because I have the same thing. Like all I do is think of like the one horrific story and I'm like, why do I know? Why is that what I'm? Th- I should be thinking about like this is a fun ride. Why would I? What a narcissism! I'm gonna be the one ride that goes off the thing, but that's how we think, you know. Yeah, water parks too. It's like there was one kid who got decapitated in Kansas City, and now right. all water slides are ruined for me, Jared. Right. Game over. He is Jared Freed. If you're looking for something to do this weekend, highly recommend you check him out. Thursday at Cap City Comedy Club at eight. Friday and Saturday, seven thirty and ten o'clock. CapCityComedy.com for tickets. You can also go to his website, that is JaredFreed.com, to check out his past work, his podcast. He does a great job on a couple of different podcasts, including the J Train podcast. And you can click to see that 37 and single pi- uh, stand up special through Netflix. Jared, thank you so much for the time today, man. This is a lot of fun. And I hope this isn't the last time you and I have a chance to chat. Absolutely, man. Dude, it's a pleasure, man. Thank you so much for having me. This was great. Always, you know, just like good to chit chat and definitely we're going to do this again. You're still watching or listening on Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, or elsewhere. I greatly appreciate you subscribing to the show and please do like today's episode. Thanks to Gentleman Jesus for the intro and outro music. Hear more of his work at gentlemanjesus.com. Thanks to you for hanging out. For more of the show and to connect on social media, visit booksonpod.com. Talk to you next time. Books on Pod. Mm-hmm.